Jesus Christ, it's like they can see into your soul. Cornbread knows my sins, Henry. Cornbread knows what I have done, and he is here to make me atone. He hears a rustling over the phone, and he pictures Henry in his heather gray pajama shirt, rolling over in bed and maybe switching on a lamp. Let's hear the cursed gobble then. Okay, brace yourself, he says, and he switches to speaker and gravely holds out the phone. Nothing. Ten long seconds of nothing. Truly harrowing, Henry's voice says tinnily over the speaker. It? Okay, this is not representative, Alex says hotly. They've been gobbling all fucking night, I swear. Sure they were, Henry says, mock gently. No, hang on, Alex says. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one to gobble. He hops off the bed and edges up to Cornbread's cage, feeling very much like he is taking his life into his own hands, and also very much like he has a point to prove, which is an intersection at which he finds himself often. Um, he says, how do you get a turkey to gobble? Try gobbling, Henry says, and see if he gobbles back. Alex blinks. Are you serious? We hunt loads of wild turkeys in the spring, Henry says sagely. The trick is to get into the mind of the turkey. How the hell do I do that? So, Henry instructs, do as I say. You have to get quite close to the turkey, like physically. Carefully, still cradling the phone close, Alex leans toward the wire bars. Okay. Make eye contact with a turkey. Do you have it? Alex follows Henry's instructions in his ear, planting his feet and bending his knees so he's at he says, and see if he gobbles back. Alex blinks. Are you serious? We hunt loads of wild turkeys in the spring, Henry says sagely. The trick is to get into the mind of the turkey. How the hell do I do that? So, Henry instructs, do as I say. You have to get quite close to the turkey, like physically. Carefully, still cradling the phone close, Alex leans toward the wire bars. Okay. Make eye contact with a turkey. Do you have it? Alex follows Henry's instructions in his ear, planting his feet and bending his knees so he's at Cornbread's eye level, a chill running down his spine when his own eyes lock on the beady, black little murder eyes. Yeah, right, now hold it, Henry says. Connect with the turkey. Earn the turkey's trust. Befriend the turkey. Okay. Buy a summer home in Mallorca with the turkey. Oh, I fucking hate you, Alex shouts as Henry laughs at his own idiotic prank, and his indignant flailing startles a loud gobble out of cornbread, which in turn startles a very unmanly scream out of Alex. God damn it! Did you hear that? Sorry, what? Henry says, I've been stricken deaf. You're such a dick, Alex says. Have you ever even been turkey hunting? Alex, you can't even hunt them in Britain. Alex returns to his bed and face plants into a pillow. I hope cornbread does kill me. No, all right. I did hear it, and it was proper frightening, Henry says. So, I understand. Where's June for all this? She's having some kind of girls' night with Nora, and when I texted them for backup, they sent back. He reads out in a monotone, ha, and then a turkey emoji and a poop emoji. That's fair, Henry says. Alex can picture him nodding solemnly. So, what are you going to do now? Are you going to stay up all night with them? I don't know, I guess. I don't know what else to do. You couldn't just go sleep somewhere else? Aren't there a thousand rooms in that house? Okay, but, uh, what if they escape? I've seen Jurassic Park. Did you know birds are directly descended from raptors? That's a scientific fact. Raptors, in my bedroom, Henry. And you want me to go to sleep like they're not going to bust out of their enclosures and take over the island the minute I close my eyes? Okay, maybe you're white ass. I'm really going to have you offed, Henry tells him. You'll never see it coming. Our assassins are trained in discretion. They will come in the night, and it will look like a humiliating accident. Autoerotic asphyxiation? Toilet heart attack.
Jesus, you've been warned. I thought you'd kill me in a more personal way. Silk pillow over my face, slow and gentle suffocation, just you and me, sensual. Ha! Huh. Well, Henry coughs. Anyway, Alex says, climbing fully up onto the bed now. It doesn't matter because one of these goddamn turkeys is going to kill me first. I really don't think... Oh, hello there. There's rustling over the phone, the crinkling of a wrapper, and some heavy snuffling that sounds distinctly dog-like. Who's a good lad, then? David says hello. Hi, David. He, oi, not for you, Mr. Wobbles. Those are mine. More rustling, a distant, offended meow. No, Mr. Wobbles, you bastard. What in the fuck is a Mr. Wobbles? My sister's idiot cat, Henry tells him. David, a mates. What are you even doing right now? What am I doing? I was trying to sleep. Okay, but you're eating Jabba cakes, so... Jaffa cakes, my God, Henry says. I'm having my entire life haunted by a deranged American Neanderthal and a pair of turkeys, apparently. And? Henry heaves another almighty sigh. He's always sighing when Alex is involved. It's amazing he has any air left. And? Don't laugh. Oh, yay, Alex says readily. I was watching Great British Bake Off. Cute. Not embarrassing, though. What else? I, uh, might be wearing one of those peely face masks, he says in a rush. Oh my god, I knew it! Instant regret. I knew you had one of those crazy expensive Scandinavian skincare regimens. Do you have that, like, eye cream with diamonds in it? No! Henry pouts, and Alex has to press the back of his hand against his lips to stifle his laugh. Look! I have an appearance tomorrow, all right? I didn't know I'd be scrutinized. I'm not scrutinizing. We all gotta keep those pores in check, Alex says. So you like Bake Off, huh? It's just so soothing, Henry says. Everything's all pastel colored, and the music is so relaxing, and everyone's so lovely to one another. And you learn so much about different types of biscuits, Alex. So much. When the world seems awful, such as when you're trapped in a great turkey calamity, you can put it on and vanish into biscuit land. American cooking competition shows are nothing like that. They're all sweaty and like dramatic death music and intense camera cuts, Alex says. I feel like this explains loads about our differences, Henry says. And Alex gives a small laugh. You know, Alex says, you're kind of surprising. Henry pauses. In what way? In that you're not a totally boring asshole. <laughs> wow, Henry says with a laugh. I'm honored. I guess you have your depths. You thought I was a dumb blonde, didn't you? Not exactly, just boring, Alex says. I mean, your dog is named David, which is pretty boring. Off to Bowie. I... Alex's head spins, recalibrating. Are you serious? What the hell, why not call him Bowie then? Bit on the nose, isn't it? Henry says. A man should have some element of mystery. I guess, Alex says. Then, because he can't stop it in time, lets out a tremendous yawn. He's been up since seven for a run before class. If these turkeys don't end him, exhaustion will. Alex, Henry says firmly. What? The turkeys are not going to Jurassic Park you, he says. You're not the bloke from Seinfeld. You're Jeff Goldblum. Go to sleep. Alex bites down a smile that feels bigger than the sentence has truly earned. You go to sleep. I will, Henry says, and Alex thinks he hears the weird smile returned in Henry's voice. And honestly, this whole night is really really weird. As soon as you get off the phone, won't I? Okay, Alex says. But, like, what if they gobble again? Go sleep in June's room, you numpty. Okay, Alex says. Okay, Henry. Go sleep in June's room, you numpty. 
Okay, Alex says. Okay, Henry agrees. Okay, Alex says again. He's suddenly very aware they've never spoken on the phone before, and so he's never had to figure out how to hang up the phone with Henry before. He's at a loss. But he's still smiling. Cornbread is staring at him like he doesn't get it. Me fucking too, buddy. Okay, Henry repeats. So, good night. Cool, Alex says lamely. Good night. He hangs up and stares at the phone in his hand, as if it should explain the static electricity in the air around him. He shakes it off, gathers up his pillow and a bundle of clothes, and crosses the hall to June's room, climbing up into her tall bed. But he can't stop thinking there's some end left loose. He takes his phone back out. I sent pics of turkeys, so I deserve pics of your animals, too. A minute and a half later, Henry, in a massive, palatial, hideous bed of white and gold linens, his face looking slightly pink and recently scrubbed, with a beagle's head on one side of his pillow and an obese Siamese cat curled up on the other, around a Jaffa cake wrapper. He's got faint circles under his eyes, but his face is soft and amused, one hand resting above his head on the pillow while the other holds up the phone for the selfie. This is what I must endure, he says, followed by... Good night. Honestly. Text message. December 8, 2019, 8.53 p.m. Yo, there's a Bond marathon, and did you know your dad was a total babe? HRH Prince Dickhead poop emoji. I- Even before Alex's parents split, they both had a habit of calling him by the other's last name when he exhibited particular traits. They still do. When he runs his mouth off to the press, his mom calls him into her office and says, Get your shit together, Diaz. When his hard-headedness gets him stuck, his dad texts him, Let it go, Claremont. Alex's mother sighs as she sets her copy of the Post down on her desk, open to an inside page article. Senator Oscar Diaz returns to D.C. for holidays with ex-wife President Claremont. It's almost weird how much it isn't weird anymore. His dad is flying in from California for Christmas, and it's fine. But it's also in the post. She's doing the thing she always does when she's about to spend time with his father, pursing her lips and twitching two fingers of her right hand. You know, Alex says from where he's kicked back on an oval office couch with a book, someone can get you a cigarette. Hush, Diaz. She had the Lincoln bedroom prepared for his dad, and she keeps changing her mind, having housekeeping undecorate and redecorate. Leo, for his part, is unfazed, and mollifies her with compliments between fits of tinsel. Alex doesn't think anyone but Leo could ever stay married to his mother. His father certainly couldn't. June is in a state, the perpetual mediator. His family is pretty much the only situation where Alex prefers to sit back and let it all unfold, occasionally poking when it's necessary or interesting, but June takes personal responsibility for making sure nobody breaks any more priceless White House antiques, like last year. His dad finally arrives in a flurry of Secret Service agents, his beard impeccably groomed and his suit impeccably tailored. For all June's anxious preparations, she almost breaks an antique vase herself, cat floor, the sound of Oscar raving about June's latest blog post for The Atlantic fading around the corner. Alex and his mother share a look. Their family is so predictable sometimes. The next day, Oscar gives Alex the follow me and don't tell your mother look and pulls him out to the Truman balcony. Merry fucking Christmas, mijo, his dad says, grinning. And Alex laughs and lets himself be hauled into a one-armed hug. He smells the same as ever, salty and smoky and like well-treated leather. His mom used to complain that she felt like she lived in a cigar bar. Merry Christmas, Pa, Alex says back. He drags a chair close to the railing, putting his shiny boots up. Oscar Diaz loves a view. Alex considers the sprawling, snowy lawn in front of them, the shoreline of the Washington Monument stretching up, the jagged French mansard roof of the Eisenhower building to the west, the same one Truman hated. His dad pulls a cigar from his pocket, 
clipping it and lighting up in the careful ritual he's done for years. He takes a puff and passes it over. It ever make you laugh to think how much this pisses assholes off? He says, gesturing to encompass the whole scene. Two Mexican men putting their feet up on the railing where heads of state eat croissants. Constantly. Oscar does laugh, then, enjoying his brazenness. He is an adrenaline junkie. Mountain climbing, cave diving, pissing off Alex's mother. Flirting with death, basically. It's the flip side of the way he approaches work, which is methodical and precise, or the way he approaches parenting, which is laid back and indulgent. It's nice now to see him more than he ever did in high school, since Oscar spends most of his year in D.C. During the busy now to see him more than he ever did in high school, since Oscar spends most of his year in D.C. During the busiest congressional sessions, they'll convene Los Bastardos, weekly beers in Oscar's office after hours, just him, Alex, and Rafael Luna, talking shit. And it's nice that proximity has forced his parents through the era of mutually assured destruction to now, where they have one Christmas instead of two. As the days go by, Alex catches himself remembering sometimes, just for a second, how much he misses having everyone under one roof. His dad was always the cook of the family. Alex's childhood was perfumed with simmering peppers and onions and stew meat in a cast iron pot for caldillo, fresh masa waiting on the butcher block. He remembers his mom swearing and laughing when she opened the oven for her guilty pleasure pizza bagels only to find all the pots and pans stored there. Or when she'd go for the tub of butter in the fridge and find it filled with homemade salsa verde. There used to be a lot of laughter in that kitchen, a lot of good food and loud music and parades of cousins and homework done at the table. Except eventually, there was a lot of yelling, followed by a lot of quiet. And soon Alex and June were teenagers, and both their parents were in Congress. And Alex was student body president and lacrosse co-captain and prom king and valedictorian. And, very intentionally, it stopped being a thing he had time to think about. Still, his dad's been in the residence for three days without incident. And one day, Alex catches him in the kitchen with two of the cooks, laughing and dumping peppers into a pot. It's just, you know, sometimes he thinks it might be nice if it could be like this more often. Zara's heading to New Orleans to see her family for Christmas, only at the president's insistence, and only because her sister had a baby, and Amy threatened to stab her if she didn't deliver the onesie she knitted. Which means Christmas dinner is happening on Christmas Eve, so Zara won't miss it. For all her late nights cursing their names, Zara is family. Merry Christmas, Z, Alex tells her cheerfully in the hall outside the family dining room. For holiday flair, she's wearing a sensible red turtleneck. Alex is wearing a sweater covered in bright green tinsel. He smiles and presses a button on the inside of the sleeve, and O oh, Christmas Tree plays from a speaker near his armpit. I can't wait to not see you for two days, she says, but there's real affection in her voice. This year's dinner is small since his dad's parents are on vacation, so the table is set for six in glittering white and gold. The conversation is pleasant enough that Alex almost forgets it's not always like this. Until it shifts to the election. I was thinking, Oscar says, carefully cutting his filet, this time I can campaign with you. At the other end of the table, Ellen puts her fork down. You can what? You know. He shrugs, chewing. Hit the trail, do some speeches, be a surrogate. You can't be serious. Oscar puts down his own fork and knife now on the cloth-covered table. A soft thump of, oh, shit. Alex glances across the table at June. You really think it's such a bad idea? Oscar says. Oscar, we went through all of this last time, Ellen tells him. Her tone is instantly clipped. People don't lack women, but they lack mothers and wives. They lack families. The last thing we need to do is remind them that I'm divorced by parading. So you'll pretend he's their dad then, eh? Oscar, Leo speaks up. You know I'd never. 
You're missing the point, Ellen interrupts. It could help your approval ratings, he says. Mine are quite high, Hell, higher than yours ever were in the house. Here we go, Alex says to Leo next to him, whose face remains pleasantly neutral. We've done studies, Oscar, okay? Ellen's voice has risen in volume and pitch, her palms planted flat on the table. The data shows I track worse with undecided voters when they're reminded of the divorce. People know you're divorced. Alex's numbers are high, she shouts, and Alex and June both wince. June's numbers are high. They're not numbers. Fuck off, I know that, she spits. I never said they were. You think sometimes you use them like they are? How dare you? When you don't seem to have any problem trotting them out every time you're up for re-election, she says, slicing one hand through the air beside her. Maybe if they were just Claremonts, you wouldn't have so much luck. It'd sure as hell be less confusing. It's the name everyone knows them by anyway. Nobody's taking any of our names, June jumps in, her voice high. June, Ellen says. Their dad pushes on. I'm trying to help you, Ellen. I don't need your help to win an election, Oscar, she says, hitting the table so hard with her open palm that the dishes rattle. I didn't need it when I was in Congress, and I didn't need it to become president the first time, and I don't need it now. You need to get serious about what you're up against. You think the other side is going to play fair this time? Eight years of Obama, and now you? They're angry, Ellen, and Richards is out for blood. You need to be ready. I will be. You think I don't have a team on all this shit already? I'm the president of the United fucking States. I don't need you to have a team on all this shit already. I'm the president of the United fucking States. I don't need you to come here and... and... Mansplain, Zara offers. Mansplain, Ellen shouts, jabbing a finger across the table at Oscar, eyes wide. This presidential race to me. Oscar throws his napkin down. You're still so fucking stubborn. Fuck you. Mom, June says sharply. Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? Alex hears himself shout before he even consciously decides to say it. Can we not be civil for one fucking meal? It's Christmas, for fuck's sake. Aren't you all supposed to be running the country? Get your shit together. He pushes his chair back and stalks out of the dining room, knowing he's being a dramatic asshole and not really caring. He slams his bedroom door behind him, and his stupid sweater plays a few depressingly off-key notes when he yanks it off and throws it at the wall. It's not that he doesn't lose his temper often, it's just he doesn't usually lose it with his family mostly because he doesn't usually deal with his family. He digs an old lacrosse t-shirt out of his dresser, and when he turns and catches his reflection in the mirror by the closet, he's right back in his teens, caring too much about his parents and helpless to change his situation. Except now, he doesn't have any AP classes to enroll in as a distraction. His hand twitches for his phone. His brain is a two-passenger minimum ride as far as he's concerned. Alone and busy, or thinking with company. But Nora is doing Hanukkah in Vermont, and he doesn't want to annoy her. And his best friend from high school, Liam, has barely spoken to him since he moved to D.C. Which leaves... What could I possibly have done to have brought this upon myself now? Says Henry's voice, voice low and sleepy. It sounds like good King Wenceslas is playing in the background. Hey, um, sorry, I know it's late, and it's Christmas Eve and everything. You probably have, like, family stuff, I'm just realizing. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. Wow, this is why I don't have friends. I'm a dick. Sorry, man, I'll, uh, I'll just... Alex, Christ, Henry interrupts. It's fine. It's half two here. Everyone's gone to bed. Except B. Say hi, B. Hi, Alex says a clear, giggly voice on the other end of the line. Henry's got his candy cane jim jams on. That's quite enough. Henry's voice comes back through, and there's a muffled sound like maybe a pillow has been shoved in B's direction. What's happening then? Sorry, Alex blurts out. I know this is weird, and you're with your sister and everything, and like, ah, uh, I kind of didn't have anyone else to call who would be awake. And I know we're, uh, not really friends, and... We don't really talk about this stuff. 
But my dad came in for Christmas, and he and my mom are like fucking tiger sharks fighting over a baby seal when you put them in the same room together for more than an hour. And they got in this huge fight, and it shouldn't matter because they're already divorced and everything, and I don't know why I lost my shit. But I wish they could give it a rest for once so we could have one single normal holiday. You know? There's a long pause before Henry says, Hang on. B, can I have a minute? Hush. Yes, you can take the biscuits. All right. I'm listening. Alex exhales, wondering faintly what the hell he's doing, but plows onward. Telling Henry about the divorce, those weird, tumultuous years, the day he came home from a Boy Scout campout, doesn't feel as uncomfortable as it probably should. He's never bothered to filter himself with Henry, at first because he honestly didn't care what Henry thought, and now because it's how they are. Maybe it should be different, bitching about his course load versus spilling his guts about this. It isn't. He doesn't realize he's been talking for an hour until he finishes retelling what happened at dinner, and Henry says, It sounds like you did your best. Alex forgets what he was going to say next. He just... Well, he gets told he's great, a lot. He just doesn't often get told he's good enough. Before he can think of a response, there's a soft triple knock on the door. June. Ah, uh, okay. Thanks, man. I gotta go, Alex says, his voice low as June eases the door open. Alex, seriously, um, thank you, Alex says. He really does not want to explain this to June. Merry Christmas. Night. He hangs up and tosses the phone aside as June settles down on the bed. She's wearing her pink bathrobe, and her hair is wet from the shower. Hey, she says. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine, he says. Sorry, I don't know what's up with me. I didn't mean to lose it. I've been, I don't know. I've been kind of off lately. It's okay, she says. She tosses her hair over her shoulder, flicking droplets of water onto him. I was a total basket case for the last six months of college. I would lose it at anybody. You know, you don't have to do everything all the time. It's fine, I'm have to do everything all the time. It's fine, I'm fine, he tells her automatically. June tilts an unconvinced look at him, and he kicks at one of her knees with his bare foot. How did things go after I left? Did they finish cleaning up the blood yet? June sighs, kicking him back. Somehow it shifted to the topic of how they were a political power couple before the divorce and how good those times were. Mom apologized, and it was whiskey and nostalgia hour until everybody went to bed. She sniffs. Anyway, you were right. You don't think I was out of line? No, though I kind of agree with what Dad was saying. Mom can be, you know, Mom. Well, that's where she got where she is now. You don't think it's ever a problem? Alex shrugs. I think she's a good mom. Yeah, to you, June says. There's no accusation behind it. Just observation. The effectiveness of her nurturing kind of depends on what you need from her. Or what you can do for her. I mean, I get what she's saying, though, Alex hedges. Sometimes it still sucks that Dad decided to pack up and move just to run for the seat in California. Yeah, but, I mean, how is that different from the stuff Mom's done? It's all politics. I'm just saying, he has a point about how Mom pushes us without always giving us the other Mom stuff. Alex is opening his mouth to answer when June's phone buzzes from her robe pocket. Oh. Hmm. She says when she slides it out to eye the screen. What? Nothing. Ah. Uh, she thumbs open the message. Merry Christmas text. From Evan. Evan? From Evan. Evan? As in ex-boyfriend Evan? In California? Y'all still text? June's biting her lip now, 
her expression a little distant as she types out a response. Yeah, sometimes. Cool, Alex says. I always liked him. Yeah, me too, June says softly. She locks her phone and drops it on the bed, blinking a couple of times as if to reset. Anyway, what did Nora say when you told her? Hmm? On the phone, she asks him. I figured it was her. You never talk to anyone else about this crap. Oh, Alex says. He feels inexplicable, traitorous warmth flash up the back of his neck. Oh, um, no, actually, this is gonna sound weird, but I was talking to Henry. June's eyebrows shoot up, and Alex instinctively scans the room for cover. Really? Listen, I know, but we kind of weirdly have stuff in common, and... I guess, similar weird emotional baggage and neuroses, and for some reason I felt like he would get it. Oh my god, Alex, she says, lunging at him to yank him into a rough hug. You made a friend. I have friends. Get off me. You made a friend. She is literally giving him a noogie. I am so proud of you. I'm gonna murder you. Stop it, he says alligator rolling out of her clutches. He lands on the floor. He's not my friend. He's someone I like to antagonize all the time, and one time I talked to him about something real. That's a friend, Alex. Alex's mouth starts and stops several silent sentences before he points to the door. You can leave, June, who is a royal. That is so bougie of you. Who would have guessed it? She says, peering over the edge of the bed at him. Oh my god, this is like all those romantic comedies where the girl hires a male escort to pretend to be her wedding date and then falls in love with him for real. That is not at all what this is like. The staff has barely finished packing up the Christmas trees when it starts. There's the dance floor to set up, menu to finalize, Snapchat filter to approve. Alex spends the entire 26th holed up in the social secretary's office with June going over the waivers they've gotten for everyone to sign after a daughter of a real housewife fell down the rotunda stairs last year. Alex remains impressed that she didn't spill her margarita. It's time once more for the legendary Balls Out Bananas White House Trio New Year's Eve party. Technically, the title is The Young America New Year's Eve Gala, or, as at least one late-night host calls it, The Millennial Correspondence Dinner. Every year, Alex, June, and Nora fill up the East Room on the first floor with 300 or so of their friends, vague celebrity acquaintances, former hookups, potential political connections, and otherwise notable 20-somethings. The party is officially a fundraiser, and it generates so much money for charity and so much good PR for the first family that even his mom approves of it. Um, excuse me. Alex is saying from a first-floor conference table, one hand full of confetti samples. Do they want a metallic color palette or a more subdued navy and gold? While staring at a copy of the finalized guest list, June and Nora are stuffing their faces with cake samples. Who put Henry on here? Nora says through a mouthful of chocolate cake. Wasn't me. J wasn't me. June? Look, you should have invited him yourself, June says, by way of admission. It's really nice you're making friends who aren't us. Sometimes when you get too isolated, you start to go a little crazy. Remember last year when Nora and I were both out of the country for a week and you almost got a tattoo? I still think we should have let him get a tramp stamp. It wasn't going to be a tramp stamp, Alex says hotly. You were in on this, weren't you? You know I love chaos, Nora tells him serenely. I have friends who aren't y'all, Alex says. Who, Alex, June says, literally, who? People, he says defensively, people from class? Liam? Please, we all know you haven't talked to Liam in a year, June says. You need friends, and I know you like Henry. Shut up, Alex says. He brushes a finger under his collar and finds his skin damp. Do they always have to crank the heat up this high when it's snowing outside? This is interesting, Nora observes. 
No, it's not, Alex snaps. Fine, he can come. But if he doesn't know anybody else, I'm not babysitting him all night. I gave him a plus one, June says. Who's he bringing? Alex asks immediately, reflexively, involuntarily. Just wondering. Pez, she says, giving him a weird look he can't parse, and he decides to chalk it up to June being confusing and strange. She often works in mysterious ways, organizes and orchestrates things he never sees coming until all the threads come together. So, Henry is coming, he guesses, confirmed when he checks Instagram the day of the party and sees a post from Pez when he checks Instagram the day of the party and sees a post from Pez of him and Henry on a private jet. Pez's hair has been dyed pastel pink for the occasion, and beside him, Henry is smiling in a soft-looking gray sweatshirt, his socked feet up on the windowsill. He actually looks well-rested for once. USA bound. Hashtag Young America Gala 2019. Pez's caption reads. Alex smiles despite himself and texts Henry. Attention. We'll be wearing a burgundy velvet suit tonight. Please do not attempt to steal my shine. You will fail, and I will be embarrassed for you. Henry texts back seconds later. Wouldn't dream of it. From there, everything speeds up, and a hairstylist is wrangling him into the cosmetology room, and he gets to watch the girls transform into their camera-ready selves. Nora's short curls are swept to one side with a silver pin shaped to match the sharp geometric lines of the bodice of her black dress. June's gown is a plunging Zach Posen number, in a shade of midnight blue that perfectly complements the navy and gold color palette they chose. The guests start arriving around eight, and the liquor starts flowing, and Alex orders a middle shelf whiskey to get things going. There's live music, a pop act that owed June a personal favor, and they're covering American Girl right now. So Alex grabs June's hand and spins her onto the dance floor. First arrivals are always the first-time political types, a small gaggle of White House interns, an event planner for Center for American Progress, the daughter of a first-term senator with a punk-rock-looking girlfriend who Alex makes a mental note to introduce himself to later, then the wave of politically strategic invites chosen by the press team, and lastly, the fashionably late. Minor to mid He's just wondering when Henry's going to make his appearance, when June appears at his side and yells, Incoming! Alex's gaze is met by a bright burst of color that turns out to be Pez's bomber jacket, which is a shiny silk thing in such an elaborate, colorful floral print that Alex almost has to squint. The colors fade slightly, though, when his eyes slide to the right. It's the first time Alex has seen Henry in person since the weekend in London and the hundreds of texts and weird in-jokes and late-night phone calls that came after, and it almost feels like meeting a new person. He knows more about Henry, understands him better, and he can appreciate the rarity of a genuine smile on the same famously beautiful face. It's a weird cognitive dissonance, Henry present and Henry past. That must be why something feels so restless and hot somewhere beneath the sternum. That and the whiskey. Henry's wearing a simple dark blue suit, but he's opted for a bright, coppery mustard tie in a narrow cut. He spots Alex, and his smile broadens, giving Pez's arm a tug. Nice tie, Alex says, as soon as Henry is close enough to hear over the crowd. Thought I might be escorted off the premises for anything less exciting. Henry says, and his voice is somehow different than Alex remembers, like very expensive velvet, something moneyed and lush and fluid all at once. And who is this? June asks from Alex's side, interrupting his train of thought. Ah, yes, you've not officially met, have you? Henry says. June, Alex, this is my best mate, Percy Oconjo. Pez, like the sweets. Pez says cheerfully, extending his hand to Alex. His hand to Alex. Several of his fingernails are painted blue. When he redirects his attention to June, his eyes grow brighter, his grin spreading. 
please do smack me if this is out of line, but you are the most exquisite woman I have ever seen in my life, and I would like to procure you the most lavish drink in this establishment, if you will let me. Uh, Alex says. You're a charmer, June says, smiling indulgently, and you are a goddess. He watches them disappear into the crowd. Pez, a blazing streak of color, already spinning June in a pirouette as they go. Henry's smile has gone sheepish and reserved, and Alex understands their friendship at last. Henry doesn't want the spotlight, and Pez naturally absorbs what Henry deflects. That man has been begging me to introduce him to your sister since the wedding, Henry says. Seriously? We've probably just saved him a tremendous amount of money. He was going to start pricing skywriters soon. Alex tosses his head back and laughs, and Henry watches, still grinning. June and Nora had a point. He does, against all odds, really like this person. Well, come on, Alex says. I'm already two whiskeys in. You've got some catching up to do. More than one conversation drops out as Alex and Henry pass, mouths hanging open over entremets. Alex tries to imagine what they must look like. The prince and the first son, the two leading heartthrobs of their respective countries, shoulder to shoulder on their way to the bar. It's intimidating and thrilling, living up to that kind of rich, untouchable fantasy. That's what people see, but none of them know the grimble fantasy. That's what people see, but none of them know the great turkey calamity. Only Alex and Henry do. He scores the first round, and the crowd swallows them up. Alex is surprised how pleased he is by the physical presence of Henry next to him. He doesn't even mind having to look up at him anymore. He introduces Henry to some White House interns and laughs as they blush and stutter, and Henry's face goes pleasantly neutral an expression Alex used to mistake as unimpressed, but can now read for what it is, carefully concealed bemusement. There's dancing and mingling, and a speech by June about the immigration fund they're supporting with their donations tonight, and Alex ducks out of an aggressive come-on by a girl from the new Spider-Man movies and into a haphazard conga line. And Henry actually seems to have fun. June finds them at some point and steals Henry away to gap at the bar. Alex watches them from afar, wondering what they could possibly be talking about that has June nearly falling over her bar stool laughing, until the crowd overtakes him again. After a while, the band breaks, and a DJ takes over with a mix of early 2000s hip-hop. All the greatest hits that came out when Alex was a child and were somehow still in rotation at dances in his teens. That's when Henry finds him, like a man lost at sea. You don't dance, he says, watching Henry, who is very visibly trying to figure out what to do with his hands. It's endearing. Wow, Alex is drunk. No, I do, Henry says. It's just the family-mandated ballroom dancing lessons didn't exactly cover this. Come on, it's like in the hips. You have to loosen up. He reaches down and puts both hands on Henry's hips. And Henry, Alex, I don't. Here, Alex says, moving his own hips. Watch me. With a grave gulp of champagne, Henry says, I am. The song crossfades into another, but a dum dum dum. Dum da dum. Da da dum. Shut up, Alex yells cutting off whatever else Henry was saying. Shut your dumb face. This is my shit. He throws his hands up in the air as Henry stares at him blankly. And around them, people start cheering too. Hundreds of shoulders shimmying to the shouty Lil John flavored nostalgia of Get Low. Did you seriously never go to an awkward middle school dance and watch a bunch of teenagers dry hump to this song? Henry is holding onto his champagne for dear life. You absolutely must know I did not. Alex flails one arm out and snatches Nora from a nearby huddle where she's been flirting with Spider-Man Girl. Nora! Nora! Henry's never watched a bunch of teenagers dry hump to this song. What? 
Please tell me nobody is going to dry hump me, Henry says. Oh my God, Henry, Alex yells, seizing Henry by one lapel as the music pounds on. You have to dance. You have to dance. You need to understand this formative American coming-of-age experience. Nora grabs Alex, pulling him away from Henry and spinning him around, her hands on his waist, and starts grinding with abandon. Alex whoops, and Nora cackles, and the crowd jumps around, and Henry just gawks at them. Did that man just say, sweat drop down my balls? It's fun. Nora against his back, sweat on his brow, bodies pushing in around him. To one side, podcast producer and that guy from Stranger Things are hitting the kid in play, and to the other, Pez is literally bending over to the front and touching his toes, as instructed. Henry's face is shocked and confused, and it's hilarious. Alex accepts a shot off a passing tray and drinks to the strange spark in his gut at the way Henry watches them. Alex pouts his lips and shakes his ass, and with extreme trepidation, Henry starts bopping his head a little. Fuck it up, vato, Alex yells, and Henry laughs despite himself. He even gives his hips a little shake. I thought you weren't going to babysit him all night, June's stage whispers in his ear as she twirls by. I thought you were too busy for guys, Alex replies, nodding significantly at Pez in the periphery. She winks at him and disappears. From there, it's a series of crowd pleasers until midnight. The lights and music blasting at full capacity. Confetti somehow blasting into the air. Did they arrange for confetti cannons? More drinks. Henry starts drinking directly from a bottle of Moet et Chandon. Alex likes the look on Henry's face. The sure curl of his hand around the neck of the bottle. The way his lips wrap around the mouth of it. Henry's willingness to dance is directly proportionate to his proximity to Alex's hands, and the amount of giddy warmth bubbling under Alex's skin is directly proportionate to the cut of Henry's mouth when he watches him with Nora. It's an equation he is not nearly sober enough to parse. They all huddle up at 11.59 for the countdown, eyes blurry and arms around one another. Nora screams, Three, two, one, right in his ear and slings her arm around his neck as he yells his approval and kisses her slip of them perpetually single and affectionately drunk and happy to make everyone else intrigued and jealous. Nora's mouth is warm and tastes horrifying, like peach schnapps, and she bites his lip and messes up his hair for good measure. When he opens his eyes, Henry's looking back at him, expression unreadable. He feels his own smile grow wider, and Henry turns away and toward the bottle of champagne clutched in his fist, from which he takes a hearty swig before disappearing into the crowd. Alex loses track of things after that, because he's very, very drunk, and the music is very, very loud, and there are very, very many hands on him, carrying him through the tangle of dancing bodies and passing him more drinks. Nora bobs by on the back of some hot rookie NFL running back. It's loud and messy and wonderful. Alex has always loved these parties. The sparkling joy of it all. The way champagne bubbles on his tongue and confetti sticks to his shoes. It's a reminder that even though he stresses and stews in private rooms, there will always be a sea of people he can disappear into. That the world can be warm and welcoming and fill up the walls of this big old house he lives in with something bright and infectiously alive. But somewhere, beneath the liquor and the music, he can't stop noticing that Henry has disappeared. He checks the bathrooms, the buffet, the quiet corners of the ballroom, but he's nowhere. He tries asking Pez, shouting Henry's name at him over the noise, but Pez just smiles and shrugs and steals a snapback off a passing yacht kid. He's... worried isn't exactly the word. Bothered. Curious. He was having fun watching. Worried isn't exactly the word. Bothered. Curious. He was having fun watching everything he did play out on Henry's face. He keeps looking, until he trips over his own feet by one of the big windows in the hallway. 
He's pulling himself up when he glances outside, down into the garden. There, under a tree in the snow, exhaling little puffs of steam, is a tall, lean, broad-shouldered figure that can only be Henry. He slips out onto the portico without really thinking about it, and the instant the door closes behind him, the music snuffs out into silence, and it's just him and Henry and the garden. He's got the hazy tunnel vision of a drunk person when they lock eyes on a goal. He follows it down the stairs and onto the snowy lawn. Henry stands quietly, hands in his pockets, contemplating the sky. And he'd almost look sober if not for the wobbly lean to the left he's doing. Stupid English dignity, even in the face of champagne. Alex wants to push his royal face into a shrub. Alex trips over a bench, and the sound catches Henry's attention. When he turns, the moonlight catches on him, and his face looks softened in half-shadows, inviting in a way Alex can't quite work out. What are you doing out here? Alex says, trudging up to stand next to him under the tree. Henry squints. Up close, his eyes go a little crossed, focused somewhere between himself and Alex's nose. Not so dignified after all. Looking for Orion, Henry says. Alex huffs a laugh, looking up to the sky. Nothing but fat winter clouds. You must be really bored with the clouds. I'm not bored, Henry mumbles. What are you doing out here? Doesn't America's golden boy have some swooning crowds to beguile? Says Prince fucking charming, Alex answers, smirking. Henry pulls a very unprincely face up at the clouds. Hardly. His knuckle brushes the back of Alex's hand at their sides, a little zip of warmth in the cold night. Alex considers his face in profile, blinking through the booze, following the smooth line of his nose and the gentle dip at the center of his lower lip, each touched by moonlight. It's freezing, and Alex is only wearing his suit jacket, but his chest feels warmed from the inside with liquor and something heady his brain keeps stumbling over, trying to name. The garden is quiet, except for the blood rushing in his ears. You didn't really answer my question, though, Alex notes. Henry groans, rubbing a hand across his face. You can't ever leave well enough alone, can you? He leans his head back. It thumps gently against the trunk of the tree. Sometimes it gets a bit much. Alex keeps looking at him. Usually, there's something about the set of Henry's mouth that betrays a bit of friendliness. But sometimes, like right now, his mouth pinches in the corner instead, pins his guard resolutely in place. Alex shifts, almost involuntarily leaning back against the tree, too. He nudges their shoulders together and catches the corner of Henry's mouth, twitching, sees something move feather light across his face. These things, big events, letting other people feed on his own energy, are rarely teen that is likely soaked in tequila, thinks maybe it would be helpful if Henry could take what he can handle and Alex could handle the rest. Maybe he can absorb some of the much from the place where their shoulders are pressed together. A muscle in Henry's jaw moves, and something soft, almost like a smile, tugs at his lips. Do you ever wonder, he says slowly, what it's like to be some anonymous person out in the world? Alex frowns. What do you mean? Just, you know, Henry says, if your mum weren't the president and you were just some normal bloke living a normal life, what things might be like, what you'd be doing instead. Ah, Alex says, considering. He stretches one arm out in front of him, makes a dismissive gesture with a flick of his wrist. Well, I mean, obviously, I'd be a model. I've been on the cover of Teen Vogue twice. These genetics transcend all circumstance. Henry rolls his eyes again. <laughs> what about you? Henry shakes his head ruefully. 
I'd be a writer. Alex gives a little laugh. He thinks he already knew this about Henry somehow, but it's still kind of disarming. Can't you do that? Not exactly seen as a worthwhile pursuit for a man in line for the throne. Scribbling verses about quarter-life angst, Henry says dryly. Besides, the traditional family career track is military, so that's about it, isn't it? Henry bites his lip, waits a beat, and opens his mouth again. I date more probably, as well. Alex can't help laughing again. Right, because it's so hard to get a date when you're a prince. I date more probably, as well. Alex can't help laughing again. Right, because it's so hard to get a date when you're a prince. Henry cuts his eyes back down to Alex. You'd be surprised. How? You're not exactly lacking for options. Henry keeps looking at him, holding his gaze for two seconds too long. The options I'd like, he says, dragging the words out. They don't quite seem to be options at all. Alex blinks. What? I'm saying that I have people who interest me, Henry says, turning his body toward Alex now, speaking with a fumbling pointedness, as if it means something. But I shouldn't pursue them. At least, not in my position. Are they too drunk to communicate in English? He wonders distantly if Henry knows any Spanish. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Alex says. You don't? No. You really don't? I really, really don't. Henry's whole face grimaces in frustration, his eyes casting skyward like they're searching for help from an uncaring universe. Christ, you are as thick as it gets, he says and he grabs Alex's face in both hands and kisses him. Alex is frozen, registering the press of Henry's lips and the wool cuffs of his coat grazing his jaw. The world fuzzes out into static, and his brain is swimming hard to keep up, adding up the equation of teenage grudges and wedding cakes and 2 a.m. texts and not understanding the variable that got him here except it's... Well, surprisingly... He really doesn't mind. In his head, he tries to cobble a list together in a panic. Gets as far as, one, Henry's lips are soft and short circuits. He tests leaning into the kiss and is rewarded by Henry's mouth sliding and opening against his. Henry's tongue brushing against his, which is, wow. It's nothing like kissing Nora earlier. Nothing like kissing anyone he's ever kissed in his life. It feels as steady and huge as the ground under their feet, as encompassing of every part of him, as likely to knock the wind out of his lungs. One of Henry's hands pushes into his hair and grabs it at the roots at the back of his head, and he hears himself make a sound that breaks the breathless silence and... Just as suddenly, Henry releases him roughly enough that he staggers backward and Henry's mumbling a curse and an apology, eyes wide, and he's spinning on his heel, crunching off through the snow at double time. Before Alex can say or do anything, he's disappeared around the corner. Oh, Alex says finally, faintly, touching one hand to his lips. Then, shit. Chapter 5 so, the thing about the kiss is, Alex absolutely cannot stop thinking about it. He's tried. Henry and Pez and their bodyguards were long gone by the time Alex made it back inside. Not even a drunken stupor or the next morning's pounding hangover can scrub the image from his brain. He tries listening in on his mom's meetings, but they can't hold his attention, and Zara bans him from the West Wing. He studies every bill trickling through Congress and considers making rounds to sweet talk senates enticing. He starts his last semester, goes to class, sits with a social secretary to plan his graduation dinner, buries himself in highlighted annotations and supplemental readings. But beneath it all, 
There's the Prince of England kissing him under a linden tree in the garden, moonlight in his hair, and Alex's insides feel positively molten. And he wants to throw himself down the presidential stairs. He hasn't told anyone, not even Nora or June. He has no idea what he'd even say if he did. Is he even technically allowed to tell anyone, since he signed an NDA? Was this why he had to sign it? Is this something Henry always had in mind? Does that mean Henry has feelings for him? Why would Henry have acted like a tedious prick for so long if he liked him? Henry's not offering any insights, or anything at all. He hasn't answered a single one of Alex's texts or calls. Okay, that's it, June says on a Wednesday afternoon, stomping out of her room and into the sitting room by their shared hallway. She's in her workout clothes with her hair tied up. Alex hastily shoves his phone back into his pocket. I don't know what your problem is, but I have been trying to write for two hours, and I can't do it when I can hear you pacing. She throws a baseball cap at him. I'm going for a run, and you're coming with me. Cash accompanies them to the reflecting pool, where June kicks the back of Alex's knees to get him going, and Alex grunts and swears and picks up the pace. He feels like a dog that has to be taken on walks to get his energy out. Especially when June says, You're like a dog that has to be taken on walks to get his energy out. I hate you sometimes, he tells her, and he shoves his earbuds in and cranks up Kid Cuddy. He thinks as he runs and runs and runs. Do you sometimes, he tells her, and he shoves his earbuds in and cranks up Kid Cuddy. He thinks as he runs and runs and runs. The stupidest thing of all is that he's straight. Like, he's pretty sure he's straight. He can pinpoint moments throughout his life when he thought to himself, see, this means I can't possibly be into guys. Like when he was in middle school and he kissed a girl for the first time, and he didn't think about a guy when it was happening. Just that her hair was soft and it felt nice. Or when he was a sophomore in high school and one of his friends came out as gay, and he couldn't imagine ever doing anything like that. Or his senior year when he got drunk and made out with Liam in his twin bed for an hour, and he didn't have a sexual crisis about it. That had to mean he was straight. Right? Because if he were into guys, it would have felt scary to be with one. But it wasn't. That was just how horny teenage best friends were sometimes. Like when they would get off at the same time watching porn in Liam's bedroom. Or that one time Liam reached over, and Alex didn't stop him. He glances over at June, at the suspicious quirk of her lips. Can she hear what he's thinking? Does she know, somehow? June always knows things. He doubles his pace, if only to get the expression on her mouth out of his periphery. On their fifth lap, he thinks back over his hormonal teens and remembers thinking about girls in the shower. But he also remembers fantasizing about a boy's hands on him, about hard jawlines and broad shoulders. He remembers pulling his eyes off a teammate in the locker room a couple times. But that was like an objective thing. How was he supposed to know back then if he wanted to look like other guys or if he wanted other guys? or if his horny teenage urges actually he's always been around. So he always assumed if he weren't straight, he would just know. Like how he knows that he loves cajeta on his ice cream, or that he needs a tediously organized calendar to get anything done. He thought he was smart enough about his own identity, that there weren't any questions left. They're rounding the corner for their eighth lap now, and he's starting to see some flaws in his logic. Straight people, he thinks, probably don't spend this much time convincing themselves they're straight. There's another reason he never cared to examine things beyond the basic benchmark of being attracted to women. He's been in the public eye since his mom became the favorite 2016 nominee. The White House trio, the administration's door to the teen and 20-something demographic, almost as long. All three of them, himself, June, and Nora, have their roles. Nora is the cool brainy one, the one who makes inappropriate jokes on Twitter about whatever sci-fi show everyone's watching, a bar trivia team ringer. She's not straight, she's never been straight. But to her, it's an incidental part of who she is. She doesn't worry about going public with it. 
Feelings don't consume her the way his do. He looks at June, ahead of him now, caramel highlights in her swinging ponytail catching the midday sun. And he knows her place, too. The intrepid Washington Post columnist, the fashion trendsetter everyone wants to have at their wine and cheese night. But Alex is the golden boy, the heartthrob, the handsome rogue with a heart of gold, the guy who moves through life effortlessly, who makes everyone laugh. Highest approval ratings of the entire first family. The whole point of him is that his appeal is as universal as possible. Not universally appealing to voters. He has a hard enough time being half Mexican. He wants his mom to keep her approval rating up without having to manage a complication from her own family. He wants to be the youngest congressman in U.S. history. He's absolutely sure that guys who kissed a prince of England and liked it don't get elected to represent Texas. But he thinks about Henry and... Oh. He thinks about Henry and something twists in his chest, like a stretch he's been avoiding for too long. He thinks about Henry's voice low in his ear over the phone at three in the morning, and suddenly he has a name for what ignites in the pit of his stomach. Henry's hands on him, his thumbs braced against his temples back in the garden. Henry's hands other places. Henry's mouth, what he might do with it if Alex let him. Henry's broad shoulders and long legs and narrow waist, the place his jaw meets his neck and the place his neck meets his shoulder, and the tendon that stretches the length between them, and the way it looks when Henry turns his head to shoot him a challenging glare, and his impossibly blue eyes. He trips on a crack in the pavement and goes stumbling down, skinning his knee and ripping his earbuds and dropping it. Once he's limped back home behind her, she disappears to shower, and he stems the bleeding with a Captain America band-aid from his bathroom cabinet. He needs a list. So, things he knows right now. One, he's attracted to Henry. Two, he wants to kiss Henry again. Three, he has maybe wanted to kiss Henry for a while. As in, probably this whole time. He ticks off another list in his head. Henry, Sean, Liam, Han Solo, Raphael Luna and his loose collars. Sliding up to his desk, he pulls out the binder his mother gave him. Demographic engagement. Who they are and how to reach them. He drags his finger down to the LGBTQ plus tab and turns to the page he's looking for, titled, with mother's typical flair, The Bee Isn't Silent, a crash course on bisexual Americans. I want to start now. Alex says as he slams into the treaty room. His mother lowers her glasses to the tip of her nose, eyeing him over a pile of papers. Start what? Getting your ass beat for barging in here while I'm working? The job, he says, the campaign job. I don't want to wait until I graduate. I already read all the materials you gave me, twice. I have time, I can start now. She narrows her eyes at him. You got a bug up your butt? No, I just... One of his knees is bouncing impatiently. He forces it to stop. I'm ready. I've got less than one semester left. How much more could I possibly need to know to do this? Put me in, coach. Which is how he finds himself out of breath on a Monday afternoon after class, following a staffer whose man knows, eyeing him over a pile of papers. Start what? Getting your ass beat for barging in here while I'm working? The job. He says, the campaign job. I don't want to wait until I graduate. I already read all the materials you gave me, twice. I have time. I can start now. She narrows her eyes at him. You got a bug up your butt? No, I just... One of his knees is bouncing impatiently. He forces it to stop. I'm ready. I've got less than one semester left. How much more could I possibly need to know to do this? Put me in, coach. Which is how he finds himself out of breath on a Monday afternoon after class, following a staffer who's managed to surpass even him in the caffeination department, on a breakneck tour of the campaign offices. He gets a badge with his name and photo on it, 
a desk in a shared cubicle, and a waspy cubicle mate from Boston named Hunter with an extremely punchable face. Alex is handed a folder of data from the latest focus groups and told to start drafting policy ideas for the end of the following week, and waspy Hunter asks him 500 questions about his mom. Alex, very professionally, does not punch him. He just gets to work. He's definitely not thinking about Henry. He's not thinking about Henry when he puts in 23 hours in his first week of work, or when he's filling the rest of his hours with class and papers and going for long runs and drinking triple-shot coffees and poking around the Senate offices. He's not thinking about Henry in the shower or at night, alone and wide awake in his bed. Except for when he is. Which is always. This usually works. He doesn't understand why it's not working. When he's in the campaign offices, he keeps gravitating over to the big, busy whiteboards of the poll. She's made easy friends with her co-workers, since competence translates directly to popularity in the campaign social culture, and nobody's better at numbers than her. He's not jealous, exactly. He's popular in his own department, constantly cornered at the Keurig for second opinions on people's drafts and invited to after-work drinks he never has time for. At least four staffers of various genders have hit on him, and Waspy Hunter won't stop trying to convince him to come to his improv shows. He smiles handsomely over his coffee and makes sarcastic jokes, and the Alex Claremont Diaz Charm Initiative is as effective as ever. But Nora makes friends, and Alex ends up with acquaintances who think they know him because they've read his profile in New York Magazine— and perfectly fine people with perfectly fine bodies who want to take him home from the bar. None of it is satisfying. It never has been, not really. But it never mattered as much as it does now that there's the sharp counterpoint of Henry, who knows him. Henry, who's seen him in glasses and tolerates him at his most annoying and still kisses him like he wanted him, singularly. Not the idea of him. So it goes, and Henry is there, in his head, and his lecture notes, and his cubicle, every single stupid day, no matter how many shots of espresso he puts in his coffee. Nora would be the obvious choice for help, if not for the fact that she's neck deep in polling numbers. When she gets into her work like this, it's like trying to have a meaningful conversation with a high-speed computer that loves Chipotle and makes fun of what you're wearing. But she's his best friend, and she's sort of vaguely bisexual. She never dates, no time or desire, turn pull. She's as knowledgeable about the topic as she is about everything else. Hello, she says from the floor as he drops a bag of burritos and a second bag of chips with guacamole on the coffee table. You might have to put guacamole directly into my mouth with a spoon because I need both hands for the next 48 hours. Nora's grandparents, the Veep and Second Lady, live at the Naval Observatory, and her parents live just outside of Montpelier. But she's had the same airy one-bedroom in Columbia Heights since she transferred from MIT to GW. It's full of books and plants she tends to with complex spreadsheets of watering schedules. Tonight, she's sitting on her living room floor in a glowing circle of screens like some kind of Capitol Hill seance. To her left, the campaign laptop is open to an indecipherable page of data and bar graphs. To her right, her personal computer is running three news aggregators at the same time. In front of her, the TV is broadcasting CNN's Republican primary coverage, while the tablet in her lap is playing an old episode of Drag Race. She's holding her iPhone in her hand and Alex hears the little whoosh of an email sending before she looks up at him. Barbacoa? She says hopefully, as Alex drops onto the couch. I've met you before today, so, obviously. There's my future husband. She leans over to pull a burrito out of the bag, rips off the foil, and shoves it into her mouth. I'm not going to have a marriage of convenience with you if you're always embarrassing me with the way you eat burritos. Alex says, watching her chew. A black bean falls out of her mouth and lands on one of her keyboards. Aren't you from Texas? She says through her mouth full. I've seen you shotgun a bottle of barbecue sauce. 
Watch yourself, or I'm gonna marry June instead. This might be his eyes joking about dating June. Well, like, what if I dated a guy? Not that he wants to date Henry. At all. Ever. But just like, hypothetically. Nora goes off on a data nerd tangent for the next 20 minutes about her updated take on whatever the fuck the boyer Moore majority vote algorithm is, and variables, and how it can be used in whatever work she's doing for the campaign. Or something. Honestly, Alex's concentration is drifting in and out. He's just working on summoning up courage until she talks herself into submission. Hey, so... Uh... Alex attempts as she takes a burrito break. Remember when we dated? Nora swallows a massive bite and grins. Why, yes I do, Alejandro. Alex forces a laugh. So, knowing me as well as you do, in the biblical sense, numbers on me being into dudes. That pulls Nora up short. Before she cocks her head to the side and says, 78% probability of latent bisexual tendencies. 100% probability this is not a hypothetical question. Yeah. So, he coughs. Weird thing happened. You know how Henry came to New Year's? He kinda... Kissed me? Oh, no shit? Nora says, nodding appreciatively. Nice! Alex stares at her. You're not surprised? I mean, she shrugs. He's gay, and you're hot, so... He sits up so quickly, he almost drops his burrito on the floor. Wait, wait, what makes you think he's gay? Did he tell you he was? No, I just... Up so quickly, he almost drops his burrito on the floor. Wait, wait, what makes you think he's gay? Did he tell you he was? No, I just, like, you know... She gesticulates as if to describe her usual thought process. It's as incomprehensible as her brain. I observe patterns and data, and they form logical conclusions, and he's just gay. He's always been gay. I... What? Dude, have you met him? Isn't he supposed to be your best friend or whatever? He's gay. Like, Fire Island on the 4th of July gay. Did you really not know? Alex lifts his hands helplessly. No? Alex, I thought you were supposed to be smart. Me too. How can he... How can he spring a kiss on me without even telling me he's gay first? I mean, like, she attempts, is it possible he assumed you knew? But he goes on dates with girls all the time. Yeah, because princes aren't allowed to be gay, Nora says as if it's the most obvious thing in the world. Why do you think they're always photographed? Alex lets that sink in for half a second, and remembers this is supposed to be about his gay panic, not Henry's. Okay, so, wait. Jesus. Can we go back to the part where he kissed me? Ooh, yes, Nora says. She licks a glob of guacamole off the screen of her phone. Happily. Was he a good kisser? Was there tongue? Did you like it? Never mind, Alex says instantly. Forget I asked. Since when are you a prude? Nora demands. Last year, you made me listen to every nasty detail about going down on Amber Forrester from June's internship. Do not, he says, hiding his face behind the crook of his elbow. I seriously hope you die, he says. Yes, he was a good kisser. And there was tongue. I fucking knew it, she says. Still waters, deep dicking. Stop, he groans. Prince Henry is a biscuit, Nora says. Let him sop you up. I'm leaving. She throws her head back and cackles, and seriously, Alex has got to get more friends. Did you like it, though? A pause. What, um, he starts. What do you think it would mean if I did? Well, babe, you've been wanting him to dick you down forever, right? Alex almost chokes on his tongue. What? Nora looks at him. Oh, shit. Did you not know that either? Shit. 
I didn't mean to, like, tell you. Is it time for this conversation? I, maybe, he says. Um, what? She puts her burrito down on the coffee table and shakes her fingers out like she does when she's about to write a complicated code. Alex suddenly feels intimidated at having her undivided attention. Let me lay out some observations for you, she says. You extrapolate. First, you've been like Draco Malfoy level obsessed with Henry for years. Do not interrupt me. And since the royal wedding, you've gotten his phone number and used it not to set up any appearances, but instead to long distance flirt with him all day, every day. You're constantly making big cow eyes at your phone. And if somebody asks you who you're texting, you act like you got caught watching porn. You know his sleep schedule, he knows your sleep schedule, and you're in a noticeably worse mood if you go a day without talking to him. You spent the entire New Year's party straight up ignoring stand next to the croquembouche. And he kissed you. With tongue. And you liked it. So, objectively, what do you think it means? Alex stares. I mean, he says slowly, I don't... know... Nora frowns, visibly giving up, resumes eating her burrito, and returns her attention to the news feed on her laptop. Okay. No, okay, look, Alex says, I know, like, objectively, on a fucking graphing calculator, it sounds like a huge embarrassing crush, but, ah, I don't know. He was my sworn enemy until a couple months ago, and then we were friends, I guess, and now he's kissed me, and I don't know what we... R. Uh-huh, Nora says, very much not listening. Yep. And still, he barrels on, in terms of, like, sexuality, what does that make me? Nora's eyes snap back up to him. Oh, like, I thought we were already there with you being bi and everything, she says. Sorry, are we not? Did I skip ahead again? My bad. Hello, would you like to come out to me? I'm listening. Hi. I don't know. He half yells miserably, am I? Do you think I'm bi? I can't tell you that, Alex, she says. That's the whole point. Shit, he says, dropping his head back on the cushions. I need someone to just tell me. How did you know you were? I don't know, man. I was in my junior year of high school and I touched a boob. It wasn't very profound. Nobody's gonna write an off-Broadway play about it. Really helpful. Yep, she says, chewing thoughtfully on a chip. So what are you gonna do? Yep, she says, chewing thoughtfully on a chip. So what are you gonna do? I have no idea, Alex says. He's totally ghosted me, so I guess it was awful or a stupid drunk mistake he regrets or... Alex, she says, he likes you. He's freaking out. You're gonna have to decide how you feel about him and do something about it. He's not in a position to do anything else. Alex has no idea what else to say about any of it. Nora's eyes drift back to one of her screens, where Anderson Cooper is unpacking the latest coverage of the Republican presidential hopefuls. Any chance someone other than Richards gets the nomination? Alex sighs. Nope, not according to anybody I've talked to. It's almost cute how hard the others are still trying, she says, and they lapse into silence. Alex is late, again. His class is reviewing for the first exam today, and he's late because he lost track of time going over his speech for the campaign event he's doing in fucking Nebraska this weekend, of all godforsaken places. It's Thursday, and he's hauling ass straight from work to the lecture hall, and his exam is next Tuesday, and he's going to fail because he's missing the review. The class is Ethical Issues in International Relations. He really has got to stop taking classes so painfully relevant to his life. He gets through the review in a haze of half-distracted shorthand and books it back toward the residence. He's pissed, honestly. Pissed at everything a crawling, directionless bad mood that's carrying him up the stairs toward the east and west bedrooms. 
He throws his bag down at the door of his room and kicks his shoes into the hallway, watching them bounce across the ugly antique rug. Well, good afternoon to you too, honey biscuit, June's voice says. When Alex glances up, she's in her room across the hall, perched on a pastel pink wingback chair. You look like shit. Thanks, asshole. He recognizes the stack of magazines in her lap as her weekly tabloid roundup, and he's just decided he doesn't want to know when she chucks one at him. New people for you, she says. You're on page 15. Oh, and your BFF's on page 31. He casually extends her the finger over his shoulder and retreats into his room, slumping down onto the couch by the door with a magazine. Since he has it, he might as well. Page 15 is a picture of him the press team took two weeks ago, a nice little package on him helping the Smithsonian with an exhibit about his mom's historical presidential campaign. He's explaining the story behind a Claremont for Congress 04 yard sign, and there's a brief write-up alongside it about how dedicated he is to the family legacy, blah, blah, blah. He turns to page 31 and almost swears out loud. The headline, Who is Prince Henry's Mystery Blonde? Three photos. The first, Henry out at a cafe in London, smiling over coffees at some anonymously pretty blonde woman. The second, Henry, slightly out of focus, holding her hand as they duck behind the cafe. The third, Henry, halfway obscured by a shrub, kissing the corner of her mouth. What the fuck? There's a short article accompanying the photos that gives the girl's name, Emily something, an actress, and Alex was generally pissed before, but now he's very singularly pissed. His entire shitty mood funneled down to the point on the page where Henry's lips touch somebody's skin that fucking how entitled, how aloof, how selfish do you have to be to spend months becoming someone's friend, let them show you all their weird, gross, weak parts, kiss them, make them question everything, ignore them for weeks, and go out with someone else and put it in the press. Everyone who's ever had a publicist knows the only way anything gets into people is if you want the world to know. He throws the magazine down and lunges to his feet, pacing. Fuck, Henry. He should never have trusted the silver spoon little shit. He should have listened to his gut. He inhales, exhales. The thing is, the thing is, he doesn't know if, beyond the initial rush of anger, he actually believes Henry would do this. If he takes the Henry he saw in a teen magazine when he was twelve, the Henry who was so cold to him at the Olympics, the Henry who slowly came unraveled to him over months, and the Henry who kissed him in the shadow of the White House, and he adds them up, he doesn't get this. Alex has a tactical brain. A politician's brain. It works fast, and it works in many, many directions at once. And right now, he's thinking through a puzzle. He's not always good at thinking, what if you were him? How would your life be? What would you have to do? Instead, he's thinking, how do these pieces slot together? He thinks about what Nora said. Why do you think they're always photographed? And he thinks about Henry's guardedness, the way he carries himself with a careful separation from the world around him, the tension at the corner of his mouth. Then he thinks, if there was a prince, and he was gay, and he kissed someone, and if there was a prince, and he was gay, and he kissed someone, and maybe it mattered, that prince might have to run a little bit of interference. And in one great mercurial swing, Alex is not just angry anymore. He's sad, too. He paces back over to the door and slides his phone out of his messenger bag. Thumbs open his messages. He doesn't know which impulse to follow and wrestle into words that he can say to someone and make something, anything, happen. Faintly, under it all, it occurs to him, this is all a very not-straight way to react to seeing your male frenemy kissing someone else in a magazine. A little laugh startles out of him, and he walks over to his bed and sits on the edge of it, considering. He considers texting Nora, 
asking her if he can come over to finally have some big epiphany. He considers calling Rafael Luna and meeting him for beers and asking to hear all about his first gay sexual exploits as an REI-wearing teenage anti-fascist. And he considers going downstairs and asking Amy about her transition and her wife and how she knew she was different. But in the moment, it feels right to go back to the source, to ask someone who's seen whatever is in his eyes when a boy touches him. Henry's out of the question, which leaves one person. Hello, says the voice over the phone. It's been at least a year since they last talked, but Liam's Texas drawl is unmistakable and warm in Alex's eardrum. He clears his throat. Uh, hey, Liam, it's Alex. I know, Liam says, desert dry. How, um, um, how have you been? A pause, the sound of quiet talking in the background. Dishes. You want to tell me why you're really calling Alex? Oh, he starts and stops, tries again. This might sound weird, but, um, back in high school, did we have, like, a thing? Did I miss that? There's a clattering sound on the other side of the phone, like a fork being dropped on a plate. Are you seriously calling me right now to talk about this? I'm at lunch with my boyfriend. Oh, he didn't know Liam had a boyfriend. Sorry. The sound goes muffled, and when Liam speaks again, it's to someone else. It's Alex. Yeah, him. I don't know, babe. His voice comes back clear again. What exactly are you asking me? I mean, like, we messed around, but did it, like, mean something? I don't think I can answer that question for you, Liam tells him. If he's anything like Alex remembers, he's rubbing one hand on the underside of his jaw, raking through the stubble. He wonders faintly if, perhaps, his clear-as-day memory of Liam's stubble has just answered his own question for him. Right, he says. You're right. Look, man, Liam says, I don't know what kind of sexual crisis you're having right now, like four years after it would have been useful, but, well, I'm not saying what we did in high school makes you gay or bi or whatever, but I can tell you I'm gay, and that even though I acted like what we were doing wasn't gay back then, it super was. He sighs about this phone call. Uh, yeah, Alex says. I think so. Thanks. You're welcome. Liam sounds so long-suffering and tired that Alex thinks about all those times back in high school. The way Liam used to look at him. The silence between them since. And feels obligated to add. And, um, I'm sorry? Jesus Christ, Liam groans and hangs up. Chapter 6 Henry Can't Avoid Him Forever There's one part of the post-royal wedding arrangement left to fulfill. Henry's presence at a state dinner at the end of January. England has a relatively new prime minister, and Ellen wants to meet him. Henry's coming too, staying in the residence as a courtesy. Alex smooths out the lapels on his tux and hovers close to June and Nora as the guests roll in, waiting at the north entrance near the photo line. He's aware that he's rocking anxiously on his heels, but can't seem to stop. Nora smirks but says nothing. She's keeping it quiet. He's still not ready to tell June. Telling his sister is irreversible, and he can't do that until he's figured out what exactly this is. Henry enters stage right. His suit is black, smooth, elegant, perfect. Alex wants to rip it off. His face is reserved, then downright ashen when he sees Alex in the entrance hall. His footsteps stutter, as if he's thinking of making a run for it. Alex is not above a flying tackle. Instead, 
He keeps walking up the steps, and... All right. He keeps walking up the steps, and... All right. Photos. Zara hisses over Alex's shoulder. Oh, Henry says, like an idiot. Alex hates how much he likes the way that one stupid vowel curls in his accent. He's not even into British accents. He's into Henry's British accent. Hey, Alex says under his breath. Fake smile, handshake, cameras flashing. Cool to see you're not dead or anything. Uh, Henry says, adding to the list of vowel sounds he has to show for himself. It is, unfortunately, also sexy. After all these weeks, the bar is low. We need to talk, Alex says, but Zara is physically shoving them into a friendly formation, and there are more photos, until Alex is being shepherded off with the girls to the state dining room, while Henry is hauled into photo ops with the prime minister. The entertainment for the night is a British indie rocker who looks like a root vegetable and is popular with people in Alex's demographic for reasons he can't even begin to understand. Henry is seated with a prime minister, and Alex sits and chews his food like it's personally wronged him and watches Henry from across the room, seething. Every so often, Henry will look up, catch Alex's eye, go pink around the ears, and return to his rice pilaf as if it's the most fascinating dish on the planet. How dare Henry come into Alex's house looking like the goddamn James Bond offspring that he is, drink red wine with the prime minister, and act like he didn't slip Alex the tongue and ghost him for a month. Nora, he says, leaning over to her while June is off chatting with an actress from Doctor Who. The night is starting to wind down, and Alex is over it. Can you get Henry away from his table? She's his table. She slants a look at him. Is this a diabolical scheme of seduction? She asks. If so, yes. Sure, yes, that, he says, and he gets up and heads for the back wall of the room, where the Secret Service is stationed. Amy, he hisses, grabbing her by the wrist. She makes a quick, aborted movement, clearly fighting a hardwired takedown reflex. I need your help. Where's the threat? She says immediately. No, no, Jesus, Alex swallows, not like that. I need to get Prince Henry alone. She blinks. I don't follow. I need to talk to him in private. I can accompany you outside if you need to speak with him, but I'll have to get it approved with his security first. No, Alex says. He scrubs a hand across his face, glancing back over his shoulder to confirm Henry's where he left him, being aggressively talked at by Nora. I need him alone. The slightest of expressions crosses over Amy's face. The best I can do is the red room. You take him any farther and it's a no-go. He looks over his shoulder again at the tall doors across the state dining room. The red room is empty on the other side, awaiting the after-dinner cocktails. How long can I have? He says. Five min, I can make that work. He turns on his heel and stalks over to the ornamental display of chocolates, where Nora has apparently lured Henry with the promise of profiteroles. He plants himself between them. Hi, he says. Nora smiles. Henry's mouth drops open. Sorry to interrupt. Important, um, international relations stuff. And he seizes Henry by the elbow and yanks him bodily away. Do you mind? Henry has the nerve to say, shut your face, Alex said the music to notice Alex frog-marching an heir to the throne out of the dining room. They reach the door, and Amy is there. She hesitates, hand on the knob. You're not going to kill him, are you? She says. Probably not, Alex tells her. She opens the door just enough to let them through, and Alex hauls Henry into the red room with him. What on God's earth are you doing? Henry demands. Shut up. Shut all the way up. Oh, my God, Alex hisses. And if he weren't already hell-bent on destroying Henry's infuriating idiot face with his mouth right now, he would consider doing it with his fist. He's focused on the burst of adrenaline carrying his feet over the antique rug. Henry's tie wrapped around his fist, the flash in Henry's eyes. He reaches the nearest wall, shoves Henry against it, and crushes their mouths together. Henry's too shocked to respond.
mouth falling open slackly in a way that's more surprise than invitation. And for a horrified moment, Alex thinks he calculated all wrong. But then, Henry's kissing him back, and it's everything. It feels as good as, better than, he remembered. And he can't recall why they haven't been doing this the whole time, why they've been running belligerent circles around each other for so long without doing anything about it. Wait, Henry says, breaking off. He pulls back to look at Alex, wild-eyed, mouth a vivid red. And Alex could fucking scream if he weren't worried dignitaries in the next room might hear him. Should we... What? I mean, uh, should we... I don't know. Slow down? Henry says, cringing so hard at himself that one eye closes. Go for dinner first, or... Alex is actually going to kill him. We just had dinner. We just had dinner. Right, I mean, I just thought. Stop thinking. Yes, gladly. In one frantic motion, Alex knocks the candelabra off the table next to them and pushes Henry onto it so he's sitting with his back against... Alex looks up and almost breaks into deranged laughter, a portrait of Alexander Hamilton. Henry's legs fall open readily, and Alex crowds up between them, wrenching Henry's head back into another searing kiss. They're really moving now, wrecking each other's suits, Henry's lip caught between Alex's teeth, the portrait's frame rattling against the wall when Henry's head drops back and bangs into it. Alex is at his throat and he's somewhere between angry and giddy, caught up in the space between years of sworn hate and something else he's begun to suspect has always been there. It's white hot, and he feels crazy with it, lit up from the inside. Henry gives as good as he gets, hooking one knee around the back of Alex's thigh for leverage, delicate, royal sensibilities nowhere in the cut of his teeth. Alex has been learning for a while, Henry isn't what he thought, but it's something else to feel it this close up, the quiet burn in him, the pent-up person under the perfect veneer who tries and pushes and wants. He drops a hand onto Henry's thigh, feeling the electrical pulse there, the smooth fabric over hard muscle. He pushes up, up, and Henry's hand slams down over his, digging his nails in. Time's up, comes Amy's voice through a crack in the door. They freeze, Alex falling back onto his heels. They can both hear it now, the sound of bodies moving too close for comfort, wrapping up the night. Henry's hips give one tiny push up into him, involuntarily, surprised. And Alex swears. I'm surprised. And Alex swears. I'm going to die, Henry says helplessly. I'm going to kill you, Alex tells him. Yes, you are. Henry agrees. Alex takes an unsteady step backward. People are going to be coming in here soon, Alex says, reaching down and trying not to fall on his face as he scoops up the candelabra and shoves it back onto the table. Henry is standing now, looking wobbly, his shirt untucked and his hair a mess. Alex reaches up in a panic and starts patting it back into place. Fuck. You look. Fuck. Henry fumbles with his shirt tail, eyes wide, and starts humming, God Save the Queen, under his breath. What are you doing? Christ, I'm trying to make it. He gestures inelegantly at the front of his pants. Go away. Alex very pointedly does not look down. Okay, so, Alex says, yeah, so here's what we're gonna do. You are gonna go be like, 500 feet away from me for the rest of the night, or else I'm going to do something that I will deeply regret in front of a lot of very important people. All right. And then, Alex says, and he grabs Henry's tie again, close to the knot, and draws his mouth up to a breath away from Henry's. He hears Henry swallow. He wants to follow the sound down his throat. And then you are going to come to the East Bedroom on the second floor at eleven o'clock tonight, and I am going to do very bad things to you, and if you fucking ghost me again, I'm going to get you put on a fucking no-fly list. Got it? Henry bites down on a sound that tries to escape his mouth and rasps. Perfectly. Alex is... Well, Alex is probably losing his mind. 
It's ten tie over the back of the chair as soon as he returned to his room, and he's got the first two buttons of his dress shirt undone. His hands are twisted up in his hair. This is fine. It's fine. It's definitely a terrible idea, but it's fine. He's not sure if he should take anything else off. He's unsure of the dress code for inviting your sworn enemy turned fake best friend to your room to have sex with you, especially when that room is in the White House, and especially when that person is a guy, and especially when that guy is a prince of England. The room is dimly lit. A single lamp, in the corner by the couch, washing the deep blues of the walls neutral. He's moved all his campaign files from the bed to the desk and straightened out the bedspread. He looks at the ancient fireplace the carved details of the mantel almost as old as the country itself, and it may not be Kensington Palace, but it looks all right. God, if any ghosts of founding fathers are hanging around the White House tonight, they must really be suffering. He's trying not to think too hard about what comes next. He may not have experience in practical application, but he's done research. He has diagrams. He can do this. He really, really wants to do this. That much he's sure about. He closes his eyes, grounds himself with his fingertips on the cool surface of his desk, the feathery little edges of papers there. His mind flashes to Henry, the smooth lines of his suit, the way his breath brushed Alex's cheek when he kissed him. His stomach does some embarrassing acrobatics he plans to never tell anyone about, ever. Henry. The Prince. Henry, the boy in the garden. Henry, the boy in his bed. He doesn't, he reminds himself, even have feelings for the guy. Really, really. There's a knock on the door. Alex checks his phone. 10.54. He opens the door. Alex stands there and exhales slowly, eyes on Henry. He's not sure he's ever let himself just... Look. Henry is tall and gorgeous, half royalty, half movie star, red wine lingering on his lips. He's left his jacket and tie behind, and the sleeves of his shirt are pushed up to his elbows. He looks nervous around the corners of his eyes, but he smiles at Alex with one side of his pink mouth and says, Sorry, I'm early. Alex bites his lip. Find your way here, okay? There was a very helpful Secret Service agent, Henry says. I think her name was Amy? Alex smiles fully now. Get in here. Henry's grin takes over his entire face. Not his photograph grin, but one that is crinkly and unguarded and infectious. He hooks his fingertips behind Alex's elbow, and Alex follows his lead, bare feet nudging between Henry's dress shoes. Henry's breath ghosts over Alex's lips, their nose is brushing, and when he finally connects, he's smiling into it. Henry shuts and locks the door behind them, sliding one hand up the nape of Alex's neck, cradling it. There's something different about the way he's kissing now. It's measured, deliberate, soft. Alex isn't sure why or what to do with it. He settles for pulling Henry in by the sway of his waist, pressing their bodies flush. He kisses back, but he lets himself be kissed however Henry wants to kiss him, which right now is exactly how he would have expected Prince Charming to kiss in the first place, sweet and deep, and like their stand expected Prince Charming to kiss in the first place, sweet and deep, and like they're standing at sunrise in the fucking moors. He can practically feel the wind in his hair. It's ridiculous. Henry breaks off and says, How do you want to do this? And Alex remembers, suddenly, this is not a sunrise in the moors type of situation. He grabs Henry by his loosened collar, pushes a little, and says, Get on the couch. Henry's breath hitches, and he complies. Alex moves to stand over him, looking down at that soft, pink mouth. He feels himself standing at a very tall, very dangerous precipice, with no intention of backing away. Henry looks up at him, expectant, hungry. You've been dodging me for weeks, Alex says, widening his stance so his knees bracket Henry's. 
He leans down and braces one hand against the back of the couch, the other grazing over the vulnerable dip of Henry's throat. You went out with a girl. I'm gay, Henry tells him flatly. One of his broad palms flattens over Alex's hip, and Alex inhales sharply, either at the touch or at hearing Henry finally say it out loud. Not something wise to pursue as a member of the royal family. And I wasn't sure you weren't going to murder me for kissing you. Then why'd you do it? Alex asks him. He leans into Henry's neck, dragging his lips over the sensitive skin just behind his ear. He thinks Henry might be holding his breath. Because I... I hoped you wouldn't murder me. I had suspicions you might want me to, Henry says. He hisses a little when Alex bites down lightly on the side of his neck. Or I thought, until I saw you with Nora, and then I was jealous. And you were jealous, Alex says. You want me. Henry moves abruptly, heaving Alex off balance with both hands and down into his lap, eyes blazing, and he says in a low and deadly voice Alex has never heard from him before, Yes, you preening Oz, I've wanted you long enough that I won't have you tease me for another fucking second. Turns out, being on the receiving end of Henry's royal authority is an extreme fucking turn-on. He thinks, as he's hauled into a bruising kiss, that he'll never forgive himself for it. So, like, fuck the moors. Henry gets a grip on Alex's hips and pulls him close. So Alex is properly straddling his lap, and he kisses hard now, more like he had in the red room, with teeth. It shouldn't work so perfectly. It absolutely makes no sense. But it does. There's something about the two of them, the way they ignite at different temperatures, Alex's frenetic energy and Henry's aching sureness. He grinds down into Henry's lap, grunting as he's met with Henry already half hard under him, and Henry's curse in response is buried in Alex's mouth. The kisses turn messy, then urgent and graceless, and Alex gets lost in the drag and slide and press of Henry's lips, the sweet liquor of it. He pushes his hands into Henry's hair, and it's as soft as he always imagined when he would trace the photo of Henry in June's magazine, lush and thick under his fingers. Henry melts at the touch, wraps his arms around Alex's waist, and holds him there. Alex isn't going anywhere. He kisses Henry until it feels like he can't breathe, until it feels like he's going to forget both of their names and titles, until they're only two people tangled up in a dark, brilliant, epic, unstoppable mistake. He manages to get the next two buttons on his shirt undone before Henry grabs it by the tails and pulls it off over his head and makes quick work of his own. Alex tries not to be in awe of the simple agility of his hands, tries not to think about classical piano or how swift and smooth years of polo have trained Henry to be. Hang on, Henry says, and Alex is already groaning in protest, but Henry pulls back and rests his fingertips on Alex's lips to shush him. I want... His voice starts and stops, and he's looking like he's resolving not to cringe at himself again. He gathers himself, stroking a finger up to Alex's cheek before jutting his chin out defiantly. I want you on the bed. Alex goes fully silent and still, looking into Henry's eyes. And the question there, are you going to stop this now that it's real? Well, come on, your highness. Alex says, shifting his weight to give Henry a last tease before he stands. You're a dick, Henry says, but he follows, smiling. Alex climbs onto the bed, sliding back to prop himself up on his elbows by the pillows, watching as Henry kicks off his shoes and regains his bearings. He looks transformed in the lamplight, like a god of debauchery, painted gold with his hair all mussed up and his eyes heavy-lidded. Alex lets himself stare, the whipcord muscle under his skin, lean and long and lithe. The spot right at the tip of his waist below his ribs looks impossibly soft, and Alex might die if he can't fit his hand into that little curve in the next five seconds. In an instant of sudden, vivid clarity, he can't believe he ever thought he was straight. Quit stalling, 
Alex says, pointedly interrupting the moment. And he settles over him with a warm, steady weight, one of his thighs sliding between Alex's legs and his hands bracing on the pillows. And Alex feels the point of contact like a static shock at his shoulders, his hips, the center of his chest. One of Henry's hands slides up his stomach and stops, having encountered the old silver key on the chain resting over his sternum. What's this? Alex huffs impatiently. The key to my mom's house in Texas, he says, winding a hand back into Henry's hair. I started wearing it when I moved here. I guess I thought it would remind me of where I came from or something. Did I or did I not tell you to quit stalling? Henry looks up into his eyes, speechless, and Alex tugs him down into another all-consuming kiss. And Henry bears down on him fully, pressing him into the bed. Alex's other hand finds that dip of Henry's waist, and he swallows a sound at how devastating it feels under his palm. He's never been kissed like this. As if the feeling could swallow him up whole, Henry's body grinding down and covering every inch of his. He moves his mouth from Henry's to the side of his neck, the spot below his ear, kisses and kisses it, and bares his teeth. Alex knows it'll probably leave a mark, which is against rule number one of clandestine hookups for political offspring, and probably royals, too. He doesn't care. He feels Henry find the waistband of his pants, the button, the zipper, the elastic of his underwear, and then... Everything goes very hazy, very quickly. He opens his eyes to see Henry bringing his hand demurely up to his elegant royal mouth to spit on it. Oh my fucking God, Alex says, and Henry grins crookedly as he gets back to work. Fuck. His body is, Alex says, and Henry grins crookedly as he gets back to work. Fuck. His body is moving, his mouth spilling words. I can't believe. God, you are the most insufferable goddamn bastard on the face of the planet. Do you know that? Fuck. You're infuriating. You're the worst. You're... Do you ever stop talking? Henry says. Such a mouth on you. And when Alex looks again, he finds Henry watching him raptly, eyes bright and smiling. He keeps eye contact and his rhythm at the same time, and Alex was wrong before. Henry's going to be the one to kill him, not the other way around. Wait, Alex says, clenching his fist in the bedspread, and Henry immediately stills. I mean, yes, obviously, oh my god, but, like, if you keep doing that, I'm gonna... Alex's breath catches. It's... that's just... that's not allowed. Before I get to see you naked... Henry tilts his head and smirks. All right. Alex flips them over, kicking off his pants until only his underwear is left slung low on his hips, and he climbs up the length of Henry's body, watching his face grow anxious, eager. Hi, he says when he reaches Henry's eye level. Hello, Henry says back. I'm going to take your pants off now, Alex tells him. Yes, good. Carry on. Alex does, and one of Henry's hands slides down, leveraging one of Alex's thighs up so their bodies meet again right at the hard crux between them, and they both groan. Alex thinks dizzily that it's been nearly five years of foreplay, and enough is enough. He moves his lips down to Henry's chest, and he feels under his mouth the beat Henry's heart skips at the realization of what Alex in is probably falling out of rhythm too. He's in so far over his head, but that's good. That's pretty much his comfort zone. He kisses Henry's solar plexus, his stomach, the stretch of skin above his waistband. I've... Ah, uh, Alex begins. I've never actually done this before. Alex, Henry says, reaching down to stroke at Alex's hair. You don't have to. I'm... No! I want to, Alex says, tugging at Henry's waistband. I just... Need you to tell me if it's awful. Henry is speechless again, looking as if he can't believe his fucking luck. Okay. Of course. Alex pictures Henry barefoot in a Kensington Palace kitchen and the little sliver of vulnerability he got to see so early on, and he thrills at Henry now, in his bed, spread out and naked and wanting. 
this can't be really happening after everything. But miraculously, it is. If he's going by the way Henry's body responds, by the way Henry's hand sweeps up into his hair and clutches a fistful of curls, he guesses he does okay for a first try. He looks up the length of Henry's body and is met with burning eye contact, a red lip caught between white teeth. Henry drops his head back on the pillow and groans something that sounds like, fucking eyelashes. He's maybe a little bit in awe of how Henry arches up off the mattress and hearing his sweet, posh voice reciting a litany of profanities to the ceiling. Alex is living for it, watching Henry come undone, letting him be whatever he needs to be while alone with Alex behind a locked door. He's surprised to find himself hauled up to Henry's mouth and kissed hungrily. He's been with girls who didn't like to be kissed afterward, and girls who didn't mind it, it occurs to him to make a comment about narcissism, but instead... Not awful, Alex says between kisses, resting his head on the pillow next to Henry's to catch his breath. Definitely adequate, Henry answers, grinning, and he scoops Alex up against his chest greedily, as if he's trying to touch all of him at once. Henry's hands are huge on his back, his jaw sharp and rough with a long day's stubble, his shoulders broad enough to eclipse Alex when he rolls them over and pins Alex to the mattress. None of it feels anything like anything he's felt before, but it's just as good, maybe better. Henry's kissing him aggressively once more, confident in a way that's rare from Henry. Messy earnestness and rough focus, not a dutiful prince, but any other twenty-something boy enjoying himself, doing something he likes, something he's good at. And he is good at it. Alex makes a mental note to figure out which shadowy gay noble taught Henry all this and send the man a fruit basket. Henry returns the favor happily, hungrily, and Alex doesn't know or care what sounds or words come out of his mouth. He thinks one of them is sweetheart and another is motherfucker. Henry is one talented bastard, a man of many hidden gifts, Alex muses half hysterically, a true prodigy. God save the queen. When he's done, he presses a sticky kiss in the crease of Alex's leg, where he'd slung it over his shoulder, managing to come off polite. And Alex wants to drag Henry up by the hair, but his body is boneless and wrecked. He's blissed out, dead. Ascended to the next plane, merely a pair of eyes floating through a dopamine haze. The mattress shifts and Henry moves up to the pillows, nuzzling his face into the hollow of Alec's eyes floating through a dopamine haze. The mattress shifts, and Henry moves up to the pillows, nuzzling his face into the hollow of Alex's throat. Alex makes a vague noise of approval, and his arms fumble around Henry's waist, but he's helpless to do much else. He's sure he used to know quite a lot of words, in more than one language, in fact, but he can't seem to recall any of them. Hmm. Henry hums, the tip of his nose catching on Alex's. If I had known this was all it took to shut you up, I'd have done it ages ago. With a feat of Herculean strength, he summons up two whole words. Fuck you. Distantly, through a slowly clearing fog, through a messy kiss, Alex can't help marveling at the knowledge that he's crossed some kind of Rubicon. Here, in this room that's almost as old as the country it's in like Washington crossing the Delaware. He laughs into Henry's mouth, instantly caught up in his own dramatic mental portrait of the two of them, painted in oils, young icons of their nations, naked and shining wet in the lamplight. He wishes Henry could see it. Wonders if he'd find the images funny. Henry rolls over onto his back. Alex's body wants to follow and tuck into his side, but he stays where he is, watching from a few safe inches away. He can see a muscle in Henry's jaw flexing. Hey, he says. He pokes Henry in the arm. Don't freak out. I'm not freaking out, he says, enunciating the words. Alex wriggles an inch closer in the sheets. It was fun, Alex says. I had fun. You had fun, right? Definitely he says, in a tone that sends a lazy spark up Alex's spine. 
we can do this again. Anytime you want, Alex says, dragging the back of his knuckles down Henry's shoulder. And you know this doesn't, like, change anything between us, right? We're still... whatever we were before, just, you know, with blowjobs. Henry covers his eyes with one hand. Right. So, Alex says, changing tracks by stretching languidly. I guess I should tell you, I'm bisexual. Good to know, Henry says. His eyes flicker down to Alex's hip, where it's bared above the sheet. And he says, as much to himself as to Alex, I am very, very gay. Alex watches his small smile, the way it wrinkles the corner of his eyes, and very deliberately does not kiss it. Part of his brain keeps getting stuck on how strange and strangely wonderful it is to see Henry like this, open and bare in every way. Henry leans across the pillow to Alex and presses a soft kiss to his mouth, and Alex feels fingertips brush over his jaw. The touch is so gentle, he has to once again remind himself not to care too much. Hey, Alex tells him, sliding his mouth closer to Henry's ear. You're welcome to stay as long as you want, but I should warn you, it's probably in both of our best interests if you go back to your room before morning. Unless you want the PPOs to lock the residence down and come requisition you from my boudoir. Ah, Henry says. He pulls away from Alex and rolls back over, looking up to the ceiling again like a man seeking penance from a wrathful god. You're right. You can stay for another round, if you want to, Alex offers. Henry, I get back to my room. Alex watches him fish his boxers from the foot of the bed and start pulling them back on, sitting up and shaking out his shoulders. It's for the best this way, he tells himself. Nobody will get any wrong ideas about what exactly this arrangement is. They're not going to spoon all night or wake up in each other's arms or eat breakfast together. Mutually satisfying sexual experiences do not a relationship make. Even if he did want that, there are a million reasons why this will never, ever be possible. Alex follows him to the door, watching him turn to hover there, awkwardly. Well, uh... Henry attempts, looking down at his feet. Alex rolls his eyes. For fuck's sake, man. You just had my dick in your mouth. You can kiss me goodnight. Henry looks back up at him, his mouth open and incredulous, and he throws his head back and laughs. And it's only him, the nerdy, neurotic, sweet, insomniac, rich guy who constantly sends Alex photos of his dog, and something slots into place. He leans down and kisses him fiercely, and then he's grinning and gone. You're doing what? It's sooner than either of them expected. Only two weeks since the state dinner, two weeks of wanting Henry back under him as soon as possible and saying everything short of that in their texts. June keeps looking at him like she's going to throw his phone in the Potomac. An invitation-only charity polo match this weekend, Henry says over the phone. It's in... He pauses, probably referring back to whatever itinerary Sean has given him. Greenwich, Connecticut? It's $10,000 a seat, but I can have you added to the list back to whatever itinerary Sean has given him. Greenwich, Connecticut? It's $10,000 a seat, but I can have you added to the list. Alex almost fumbles his coffee all over the south entryway. Amy glares at him. Jesus, fuck, that is obscene. What are you raising money for, monocles for babies? He covers the mouthpiece of his phone with his hand. Where's Zara? I need to clear my schedule for this weekend. He uncovers the phone. Look. I guess I'll try to make it, but I'm really busy right now. I'm sorry, Zara said you're bailing on the fundraiser this weekend because you're going to a polo match in Connecticut? June asks from his bedroom doorway that night, almost startling another cup of coffee out of his hands. Listen, Alex tells her, I'm trying to keep up a geopolitical public relations ruse here. Dude, people are writing fan fiction about y'all. Yeah. Nora sent me that. I think you can give it a rest. 
The crown wants me to be there, he lies quickly. She seems unconvinced and leaves him with a parting look he'd probably be concerned about if he cared more about things that aren't Henry's mouth right now. Which is how he ends up in his J-Crew best on a Saturday at the Greenwich Polo Club, wondering what the hell he's gotten himself into. The woman in front of him is wearing a hat with an entire taxidermied pigeon on it. High school lacrosse did not prepare him for this kind of sporting event. Henry on horseback is nothing new. Henry in full polo gear, the helmet, the polo sleeves capped right at the bulge of his biceps, the snug white pants tucked into tall leather boots, the intricately buckled leather knee padding, the leather gloves, is familiar. He has seen it before. Categorically, it should be boring. It should not provoke anything visceral, carnal. But Henry urging his horse across the field with the power of his thighs, his ass bouncing hard in the saddle, the way the muscles in his arms stretch and flex when he swings, looking the way he does and wearing the things he's wearing, it's a lot. He's sweating. It's February in Connecticut, and Alex is sweating under his coat. Worst of all, Henry is good. Alex doesn't pretend to care about the rules of the game, but his primary turn-on has always been competence. It's too easy to look at Henry's boots digging into the stirrups for leverage and conjure up a memory of bare calves underneath, bare feet planted just as firmly on the mattress. Henry's thighs open the same way, but with Alex between them. Sweat dripping down Henry's brow onto his throat. Just, uh, well, just like that. He wants, God, after all this time ignoring it, he wants it again, now, right now. The match ends after a circle of hell amount of time, and Alex feels like he'll pass out or scream if he doesn't get his hands on Henry soon. Like the only thought possible in the universe is Henry's body and Henry's flushed face, and every other molecule in existence is just an inconvenience. I don't like that look. Amy says when they reach the bottom of the stands, peering into his eyes. You look... sweaty. I'm gonna go, uh, Alex says. Say hi to Henry. Amy's mouth settles into a grim line. Please don't elaborate. Yeah, I know, Alex says. Plausible deniability. I don't know what you could possibly mean. Sure. He rakes a hand through his hair. Yep. Enjoy your summit with the English delegation, she tells him flatly, and Alex legs it toward the stables, limbs already buzzing with a steady knowledge of Henry's body getting incrementally closer to his. Long, lean legs, grass stains on pristine, tight pants. Why does this sport have to be so completely repulsive while Henry looks so damn good doing it? Oh, shit. He barely stops himself from running headfirst into Henry in the flesh, who has rounded the corner of the stables. Oh, hello. They stand there staring at each other, fifteen days removed from Henry swearing at the ceiling of Alex's bedroom and unsure how to proceed. Henry is still in his full polo regalia, gloves and all, and Alex can't decide if he is pleased or wants to brain him with a polo stick. Polo bat? Polo club? Polo... Mallet? This sport is a travesty. Henry breaks the silence by adding, I was coming to find you, actually. Yeah, hi. Here I am. Here you are. Alex glances over his shoulder. There's, uh, cameras. Three o'clock. Right, Henry says, straightening his shoulders. His hair is messy and slightly damp. Color still high in his cheeks from exertion. 